Welcome. Uh, today, uh, we have as our guest, uh, Professor James Kurth, uh, who is the author of uh, this very, very uh, timely book, The American Way of Empire, uh, how uh, she won a world, uh, won a war and lost, how she won the world and lost her way. <laughs> and I'm familiar with this book because I edited it. It was so good uh, that we published it ourselves and it's available on Amazon and in Kindle and in hardback and in paperback and in audiobook if you want to listen to it while uh, exercising or in your car. And I don't think you could find a better, more appropriate book that explains what's going on right this moment than the analysis from Professor Kurth. Uh, professor Kurth is a professor emeritus at Swarthmore College. I won't go over his whole resume. You can find it in the flap of the book or the website uh, uh, at uh, pennyapagepress.com. Uh, and uh, I want to go straight to the breaking news of the fall of Afghanistan, which I think I wouldn't say you were prophetic, but I would certainly say you, because the age of prophecy is over, but I would say you foresaw it and uh, you predicted it and you forecast it. And indeed, I remember you forecast it when the war started. You wrote an article saying America would lose. And I said, well, that seems very extreme. Well, here we are 20 years later and we lost. So I think. Uh, score one for Professor Kurth predictions. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to have some more today. Right now, you're working on a book about the grand chronicle of the coronavirus crisis, um, which uh, is going to actually have some uh, very interesting uh, analysis, including, I believe, a religious analysis of what's going on. And uh, there are many stages involved and many crises involved. Um, it's uh, sort of like Nixon's book, Six Crises, but I think you have 10 crises uh, in it. And uh, so if you could just tell us what the fall of Afghanistan mean, Afghanistan means strategically for the United States and the world, and how it plays a role in this ongoing crisis uh, of uh, Western civilization, I believe uh, you would say. Thank you. Well, Larry, I think you summed up my uh, understanding of things. And, to, and the direction of the book that I'm now working on, I think you'll uh, sum that up very well. Uh, I, I, on the eve of the coronavirus beginning to hit with a big impact in the United States in March of 2020, I sort of thought there would be a succession of 10 stages uh, flowing out of what was soon to be the first stage, the medical uh, challenge, the medical crisis, the coronavirus itself. And then I assume that that would give rise to an economic response. Uh, uh, first, first, much of the businesses would shut down, but in addition, government would get involved and that would aggravate the economic crisis. So the second crisis came along more or less on schedule uh, with a sudden plum, a plunge in the economy and a sudden massive response by the government in terms of a very massive, unprecedented deficit spending that issued in the economic crisis. But I also figured that that would issue in the third crisis, which was the political crisis. Now I must admit, I didn't anticipate that there would be the Black Lives Matter phenomenon, but I did predict there would be demonstrations, uh, there'd be violence, uh, uh, especially because it was in an election year, 2020. And that more or less came on schedule, although it turned out the actual crisis was worse than I had thought. I had not predicted, for example, on Black Lives Matter. I, I had thought the election would be contested, but I never thought it would be contested to the degree it was. And I didn't predict, of course, the demonstrations at the Capitol on January 6th. But then I knew the whole world, or at least our adversaries, were watching. And that is when they saw the political disorder coming out of the political crisis, then they would pose in 2021 a strategic crisis. And that would mean the major countries that are in technical language, revisionist powers, that is to say, they are once great powers, they went into decline, what the Chinese call their century of humiliation. Now they're back. They want to revise, that's where the word revisionist comes from, revise the territory around them, the region around them. And the three major revisionist powers, very different, are China, Russia, 
and Iraq. Each considers the United States its chief adversary, as the Iranians call the Great Satan. Uh, and they want to expand their influence uh, within their region or territory. And with the Chinese, that is uh, the uh, East Asia, the Western Pacific, that includes the South China Sea and uh, Taiwan, the East China Sea, uh, with Russia, that includes expanding uh, their influence uh, in Ukraine, obviously, uh, but even beyond, uh, they would like to have more influence in what had been part of their sphere of influence under the Soviet bloc. But, but it wouldn't be that they'd be annexing these countries. They just want to have the classical demand of any great power. And that is to say, on their borders, they have uh, uh, buffer states with friendly governments. Uh, and with the Iranians, where they're very far advanced in their grand program, and that is to restore the great uh, arc, the, the Shiite or Iranian crescent from the Iranian plateau, where, uh, where it is Iran proper, where the Persian or Farsi speaking population lives, uh, all the way to the Mediterranean. The, uh, the, the Iranians and the, the Persians, who are actually the uh, original name of that people in that area, they've been pressing for the, middle, the, for the Mediterranean, a great drive to the West, ever since the Persian Empire of Darius and Cyrus and Xerxes 2,500 years ago. And so each of them is moving in that direction. And I knew that if there were to be a new administration, uh, then each of them would follow the classical pattern of adversary powers. They test the will, uh, the, uh, the uh, of uh, correctness of the strategy. They, they test the United States, the new administration. And then if they, you, the administration is tough, then they stand back. If the administration is divided and can't get its act together, they press forward. So that's what I had predicted would happen in 2021. Now I had not predicted that the detonator of all those three countries, uh, or the accelerator, would be Afghanistan. I knew that the Afghan uh, uh, war was, uh, was a, we were fighting the Afghan war with what we thought was an Afghan army, but it was a Potemkin army. It, it looked like an army on the outside. If you took a photograph of these soldiers in their uniforms, they looked like an army on the inside. No one in Afghanistan identifies as being Afghan. They are Pashtuns or Uz uh, Uzbeks or, or Tajiks or Hazaras. Uh, that's the Shiites who live on the Western border. And in any event though, it was only a matter of time till this Potemkin army, this phony army uh, would collapse under the real people who have fire in their belly, uh, who are truly committed to being Pashtuns and at the same time Islamist. And there was only a matter of time until the real army defeated the Potemkin army. And that happened, of course, just last week. Uh, ironically enough, uh, Kabul surrendered on August 15th and, uh, of 2021, and that was the uh, 76th uh, anniversary to the day, uh, August 15th of 1945, when the Japanese surrendered to the United States. And so I believe now that the three revisionist powers I identified will now press forward in what is not only the political disarray of the United States and the economic palsy that will come with defense spending uh, on, on defense spending because of the, the massive spending on all these other things. Uh, and, but they will press, but they now see the United States has had a dramatic loss of its credibility of standing firm in support of its allies. And now they will press forward. They will, uh, they will be, uh, they're very, the Chinese will be most patient, 
pressing steadily. They're doing that in Taiwan now with these military exercises. The Russians will be a bit more impetuous, but Putin is one of the wisest, from Russian point of view, statesmen in all of Russian history. So they won't be impetuous either. Uh, uh, the, the Iranians, this Islamic Republic regime, uh, sometimes they are a little bit overcome by their ideology or their theology, uh, and they may press forward. They've already made a move even before Afghanistan. And that was a plan that they concocted no later than January 20th of uh, 2021, inauguration day for President Biden. At that point, they determined they would test him. And they laid a plan that would deal with, uh, would uh, deal with, uh, uh, they would deploy their proxies, that's a typical Iranian strategy, uh, in the area around Israel. Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Assad regime, and they planned, I could go into the details, but uh, at the moment I won't, they planned to have the, uh, the test of Israel and of America's support for Israel occur at the conjunction, the conjunction in May of the end of Ramadan and also the end of the Jerusalem Day weekend simultaneously a, an Islamic holiday and a uh, Israeli holiday. And sure enough, right on target, that's when it came. Uh, and of course, the center of that was the Temple Mount. They know that has immense significance to the entire Islamic world, and they know it has significance to the Israelis. And so that 11-day war was essentially the Iranians' way of testing the Biden administration's support of Israel. And what was the uh, uh, result of that test? What were the grades? Oh, they feel validated. They know this. They know that the Israeli army uh, was about ready to do to Hamas after some uh, nine, 10, or 11 days of war, what they had always done uh, whenever they could with their past adversaries who had launched an attack upon them such as the Egyptians in 1967, or the, uh, again, the Egyptians in 1973. And that is after uh, a kind of, uh, oh, the Israelis have, Israeli defense forces having to get their forces <laughs> sort of on the forward foot, uh, they get their act together. Then they want to go in and punish the aggressor uh, so he won't try that again. And they, of course, were doing that. They were taking out all the Hamas installations, the tunnels, the headquarters, the weapons caches in, uh, in uh, the uh, Gaza territory. They were taking about that and they would want to have gone for another three or four days to complete the job. But the uh, Biden administration came in when the job had only been about one third completed and essentially delivered to uh, Netanyahu, uh, or actually to the current government, they uh, they uh, they delivered the message that uh, uh, you have to stop that, otherwise we won't be supporting you. Well, we might think, well, what would that be? Well, it turns out the dirty little secret of the Iron Dome, which of course was largely and is Israeli designed, largely Israeli manufactured, but. Uh, it was actually developed in uh, cooperation with one of the giant American corporations, uh, defense corporations, Raytheon, and they, re and they need Raytheon technicians to help maintain it and repair it. Uh, and so that was, the, the, that was the offer that you know, Biden made that Israel, Israel couldn't refuse, that if you persist, we will no longer support you with these steady stream of American technicians. And so what happened was that Israel uh, then stopped about one third halfway through what the IDF had wanted to do. Uh, and that, and the Iranians said, see, that proves that the Biden administration and the Democratic Party behind it and the congressional representation, especially the progressives in the Congress, uh, the AOC wing, so to speak, the squad, uh, if, if that, uh, that proves that ultimately the Biden administration doesn't have Israel's back. So that means we can be, lay, lay the groundwork for future pressure with Hamas, with Hezbollah, with uh, our uh, proxies in the West Bank itself. And even our proxies 
this is the uh, 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 Islamic uh, uh, movement of Palestine or something. That's a, that's a phony uh, proxy for the Iranians, even within East Jerusalem. So you've pointed out that there, we've already seen two strategic tests in the United States. I'm guessing from your estimate has failed both in Israel and in Afghanistan. Um, what comes next? Well, I've indicated that I think the Iranians, uh, be, uh, sometime in the remainder of 2021, will have another test of Israel. Uh, there's already some clue uh, about uh, rockets sent from um, Hezbollah uh, or territory or in Syria, uh, rockets sent from uh, uh, technically Syrian uh, territory, but sent by a representation, I mean, members of the Iranian Revolution, uh, Revolutionary Guard. And they, there were a couple of those rockets actually sent during all the much more uh, barrage of rockets sent from Hamas to the, from the South. And they were sent and they were kind of signals that the head of Hezbollah in, uh, in Lebanon, but Hezbollah supported by the Iranians. He, he mentioned all of that and mentioned it as a threat. So in other words, they were essentially telling the Israelis at the midst of the greatest threat of the rockets from Hamas, oh, there's more of those uh, to your north where we are. And they can come from there too. And these are much more long distance. They have, they're much more numerous. There's more than 100,000. Uh, and already the... Uh, 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 several, about four or five rockets have been sent from that Iranian occupied or influenced territory in Lebanon and Syria, north of Israel. Already several have been sent uh, and they have demonstrated their long range capability by flying over Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and beyond so that they actually hit near Dimona, which is the Israeli nuclear uh, uh, installations. So uh, in terms of your strategic uh, crisis model then, uh, do you foresee something similar happening in Taiwan or Japan, Korea? Well, let's focus on that. Now, when we're dealing with Taiwan, of course, we are dealing with the Chinese. It's a dispute if the Taiwanese are Chinese or not, but of course, across the Taiwan states are indisputably Chinese Chinese. And the Chinese have a very ancient strategic culture. It's even more ancient than the Persians, 2,500 years. Uh, and they're very patient and persistent and step by step. You might almost say, hey, it's a, a strategy uh, of a thousand cuts. A cut here, a cut there, and uh, your, uh, your adversary is weakened. It all corresponds to a game that every Chinese uh, uh, boy knows when he's growing up and plays with his friends. That is uh, Wang Chi, uh, and that is uh, that is a game that is sort of the Chinese chess, except it's uh, I dare I say on steroids over in extra dimensions, and it's all positioning so that eventually you surround the adversary and you realize he's been out positioned. And as Sun Tzu, the great Chinese strategist said, uh, the acme of generalship is to win the battle without fighting. In other words, to position so that you present to the adversary a fait accompli. And he has only one course, and that is to surrender. Of course, you give him a graceful face-saving way out. Well, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing, step by step, uh, uh, eating away at Taiwan, its uh, military defenses, its uh, uh, legal defenses, its economic defenses. I could go into detail on each of them, step by step, tightening the noose around Taiwan, like the Iranians are intent on tightening the noose around Israel. Uh, and, but I believe the Chinese can be much more patient uh, uh, just as long as every step they make a pocket becomes irreversible. Then they make the next step uh, and the next step. Now, there is a certain time uh, element of playing away here. For example, the recent re retiring and the current commander 
of the, of the Indo-Pacific Command, and within that, also the commanders of the uh, Pacific Fleet, that is say the Navy forces, they have testified before Congress that they think that Xi Jinping and the China will actually make a move to actually uh, occupy and annex Taiwan before the end of the decade. That, in other words, nine years. They actually think it might be as early as five to seven years. And amongst the American military, the idea that the great push might come uh, within five or seven years, but that could be as long as five or seven years ago. Uh, I believe that Xi Jinping could live with that particular uh, uh, timetable. He could delay it that long, uh, but he has his own particular timetable. Now, the first one that all of the Chinese Communist Party agree on, and that is that Taiwan must be reclaimed by 2049. 2049, that's a long ways away. That's the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the uh, People's Republic of China under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. In other words, in 1949. And the official Chinese history of a, a talk by the Communist Party. It's prior to that was a hundred years of humiliation. And under the forward leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, we had the hundred years of rejuvenation or restoration. And they won't complete that until they have acquired Tehran. So that's the outer limit, outer limit. But personally, Xi Jinping has a limit. T normally, uh, the Chinese leaders remain very active uh, in influencing uh, the government, even after they may have officially retired, but they remain as uh, kind of elder statesmen uh, also holding the real levers of power. That happened with the Deng Xiaoping. Uh, that happened with Chan Chi Min, his successor, uh, Hu Chintao, and that will happen with uh, uh, Xi Jinping. Now, the maximum time that these people can have their influence by the Chinese convention is roughly age 80, age 80. Now, Xi Jinping is only 68. I think he wants to remain, remain uh, the full formal president of the, uh, China, of the People's Republic and the chair of the, uh, of the uh, Chinese Communist Party until then, but he definitely will want to have the whole thing, the Taiwan thing completed by the time he's age 80 or 12 years from now. So, so when I put this all together, you can see that the Chinese could actually defer actually moving fully to occupy Taiwan. Oh, uh, uh, nearest, according to the Pacific fleet commanders, um, uh, until the end of, well, five to seven years from now. But there are all sorts of things they can do in between now to paralyze the Chinese economy, uh, the Taiwanese economy, to break the will to defend of the Chinese people, even to, grit, to grind down the uh, operational capability of the Chinese Air Force. Uh, the way they do that is to always have these intrusive air flights with Chinese communist bombers and fighters and that sort of thing. That forces the Taiwanese to come up and kind of, uh, you know, try to contest their territory, not shoot down, shoot them down, just fly around. That's the way these things go. It ha uh, uh, and, and, but every time that happens, that degrades the capability of the rather small Taiwanese air. And then the third revision is power. You mentioned taking advantage of this uh, new era is Russia. What's Russia going to do? Well, uh, most American analysts and certainly the Democratic and Republican political establishment think that Russia is aggressive and reckless and who knows what they could do. Surely will be something aggressive and reckless. Well, I've already said that I think Putin is from a Russian point of view, the wisest statesman, one of the wisest statesmen in uh, Russian history, certainly in the 20th century uh, and 21st century. Uh, and, um, uh, and I believe that he too can be patient, but uh, in a somewhat different way. Uh, his objectives are the following. He wants to make sure that 
every former Soviet Republic, of course that includes Ukraine, it includes Belarus, it includes Moldova, uh, but it also includes uh, the three Caucasus republics, that is to say, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, and it includes the three Baltic republics, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. He wants to make sure that each in their own way will provide, if not a friendly government, that's asking an awful lot from the Baltic republics, if not a friendly government, they will not pose a security threat uh, to uh, Russia. In other words, he has in mind for the Baltics something similar to the position of Finland, which in a way is a Baltic state, uh, it, during the Cold War, in which Finland was not a member of NATO. It wasn't even a member of the European Union, uh, but it was allowed a Western political system, Western newspapers. Uh, uh, it had a lot of ties with the Western economies. And above all, <coughs> excuse me, uh, above all, it um, uh, did not provide any basis for the West uh, and therefore in no way posed a direct security threat to the uh, uh, Soviet Union. Well, that I believe is the objective that Putin has uh, for the uh, Baltic states. He'd be willing to have them be independent, uh, 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 not only formally, but really just as long as they stop allowing these Western troops to go running up and down for these exercises. All right, well, that's all very interesting. Well, that, but I haven't completed. That's oh, the most okay. mild. That's the most mild. Now, uh, going around the great circle of Russian interest on their frontiers, um, in the uh, Ukraine, which they do consider really, well, you know, it's the old Russian phrase, uh, there are the three Russias, Great Russia, uh, Little Russia, uh, and White Russia, uh, and they are respectively uh, Russia, uh, and Ukraine, and Belarus. And so they consider Ukraine the Little Russia, uh, and properly uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, Putin's language is always careful to imply that people in Ukraine are more Russian than they are Ukrainian. Uh, and so what he would like to do is consolidate what he's already achieved in the Eastern Ukraine, including Crimea. He certainly wants to make sure that everybody knows there's no turning back from Russia uh, uh, having uh, as part of the Russian Federation territory, the Crimea. And he would like to have those uh, various uh, areas in the Eastern Ukraine uh, that are occupied by uh, Russian uh, allies, uh, some little green men, of course, Russian soldiers in little green uniforms. They, they would like to have them, uh, uh, that becomes accepted. Well, that's a permanent reality. There are a number of other places uh, scattered around the former Soviet Union where you have these kind of frozen conflicts with Russia having a little slice of, of some former republic that got uppity to try to succeed. And that, for example, there's such slices, uh, 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 Abkhazia and uh, Southern U uh, 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 Eusatia in Georgia, and there's a similar thing in Moldova. So uh, all of those have been accepted now for uh, 15, in case of Moldova, 25 years. And he would like to have that established. And uh, along the way, he would like to have the West stop talking because it's all talk about the possibility uh, or the desirability of Ukraine joining the European Union, or especially NATO, saying for Georgia, none of that stuff. That's all just he thinks is silly talk. Uh, so his aims are actually quite modest. They're not really wanting to do much beyond what he has now, but he wants the all that Western rhetoric to undo it. Uh, and sometimes sending arms to this or that uh, a country that was used to be in the former Soviet Union. Uh, uh, he wants that to end. Okay. Let me just switch to a little bit of domestic analysis. Uh, some people, such as myself, but I've read other accounts on the internet, believe that uh, Biden intentionally 
gave away Afghanistan. Uh, sort of the same model like who lost China or, uh, or the CIA put Castro in or, or whatever. Uh, others say, no, it's incompetence. Uh, and uh, it's just due to being uh, uh, new on the job and inheriting a mess from Trump. Uh, and there are all sorts of other positions. What's your analysis of the factors behind Biden's decision to essentially turn everything over to the Taliban so quickly and so clumsily that it inflicted such a humiliation on the United States? Well, I think each of the uh, theories that you put forward, and I would add a third theory, uh, focusing on the normal ways that bureaucracies, including militaries or intelligence services occupy, uh, each of those theories are part of the answer to your question, but I should distinguish uh, what is what. Now, first I think Biden, and this goes back even to the mid seventies, in other words, this goes back uh, 35, uh, uh, actually, yeah, 45 years. Uh, uh, Biden, since he was a young congressman and then a young senator in the 70s, uh, always learned the lessons of Vietnam. We don't want to repeat that. We don't want to get in there. Uh, and if somebody puts us there, then we want to get out. And that was consistent in the decades since. Uh, he first applied that to Vietnam at the famous time of the uh, April 1975, Saigon 75, and people ought to remember at the same time was Phnom Penh 1975. In other words, uh, the North Vietnamese weren't such nice guys in Vietnam, but compared to the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, oh, well, they were just saints. Uh, and anyway, at that time, and ever since, Biden said, we didn't owe it, the Vietnamese anything or the Cambodians, they just wouldn't fight. In other words, he used the same language at that time and looking back on it that he has now used publicly about the Afghans. Okay. Uh, then in between, there were such things as uh, Iraq and he had a similar, uh, although he did vote because all the Democrats uh, were overwhelmingly supporting the, uh, the, the invasion of Iraq by George W. Bush in 2003, uh, uh, he, he uh, quickly found reasons why the United States should not stay in, why it should get out. So he's been very consistent. And along that consistency is always expressing a contempt for the government and the army and to some extent, the people of the countries that are at stake. So in this sense, all he had to do in a, what I think is a rather aged brain is reach back to the fundamental ideas that have been up there on the shelf for now uh, 45 years uh, and pull them down, dust them off and put on a new label. It's, it's called Afghanistan. So, that, so in that sense, I, I think he came in determined to get out. And uh, although he changed every other Trump policy, he thought, well, that's convenient. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to get out and anything goes wrong, I'll blame it on Trump. <laughs> and so in that sense, there was something intentional. He intended to get out. However, we knew that as early as April of 2021, when he made clear he was getting out. And then the question is, well, what explains <laughs> the horrendous debacle of the way we got out, including the way we are having trouble getting out now <laughs> from that little itsy bitsy Kabul airport uh, uh, with the Taliban with a perimeter all around it, another noose around somebody's neck, just kind of ours. Uh, and how, so how, uh, how, how did that happen? Well, here I think he was the victim, amazing, a victim. Uh, he was the victim of the way that the uh, national security bureaucracies, which Trump was perceptive enough to refer to as the deep state, because they are, uh, but Biden, he thinks he's the state or he's chief of state. Little does he know <laughs> that the, the bureaucracies were feeding him a tissue of lies uh, and he believed them. And so he believed uh, what the bureaucracies fed uh, Biden uh, uh, and fed the Congress and fed the public. Oh, well, uh, uh, at worst, uh, the uh, Taliban may take 
Kabul, uh, six months, nine months from now, that was what they first said. Then when all those provincial capitals, well, maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, 30 days, I mean, three months, and then suddenly nine, 90 uh, days became 90 hours. Uh, and indeed, overnight, I mean, excuse me, over the weekend. Uh, I mean, Anthony Blinken, who incidentally, along with Jake Sullivan, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, they know nothing about Afghanistan and the people within it. Uh, no place in their career would they have ever learned what's important to the Afghans that will make them fight uh, uh, against each other or uh, united against some foreigner. They know nothing about that. What they really know about is their, uh, what they learned in law school and have applied since. And that is the uh, international law and the uh, rules and norms uh, order of the liberal international system. And I, there, they, the, bureau, the military bureaucracies kept reassuring Biden that, uh, oh no, we'll, we'll be able to get out in a dignified stately way. No Saigon 1975. Uh, and, the, and it turned out that was all a lie. Anybody on the ground knew, as I've said earlier, that the Afghan army was a Potemkin army, a phony army, and all it would take is to have a big pressure. And then all of a sudden, what would happen, uh, the army, certainly at the level of the enlisted men and the junior officers, but even of the local commanders, they would lose, lose a war the Afghan way. There is an Afghan way of losing a war. And this is the way the Afghans and the military units uh, have lost wars uh, for, let's say, pretty much 1,000 years or more, ever since the Pashtuns became fully a, uh, a kind of self-conscious large uh, presence, largest, the largest presence of all the ethnic presence in Afghanistan. And here's the Afghan way of losing a war. You are fighting an adversary. And at a certain point, uh, uh, fate, Allah, will bless the adversary uh, and they will become clearly stronger than you. And then following Sun Tzu, although they were following their interpretation of Muhammad's way of fighting a war rather than Sun Tzu at the Chinese, but in essence, well, uh, okay, the adversary has positioned himself so that we're going to lose. So then that means we ought to surrender or we still have some bargaining power. And so what happens is that an Afghan army can dissolve extremely quickly because uh, as soon as it becomes uh, widespread uh, uh, understanding in the, amongst the commanders who are trying to defend against this adversary who's getting, getting stronger and stronger, as soon as that becomes widespread, it's sort of like a stock market crash. Everybody's trying to flee across, uh, uh, very quickly. And so everybody wants to surrender most quickly because they'll get the best bargaining power. And if you surrender too late, then don't, you don't get so much bargaining power. And what are the terms of the bargaining power? It's always this. Well, you can preserve your life. You might, you could even go away. You just turn over all your weapons and all your resources. That's what happened. That's why we've had uh, several billion dollars of American equipment uh, turned over instantly. That's the terms of the deal. That's the Afghan way of losing a war. Of course, the Afghans like to win a war and the Taliban shows how that's done in the Afghan way. But the reason why this collapsed so quickly is the Afghan commanders knew their army was a Potemkin army, a paper mache army. Why did they know that? Because they had taken all the nourishment, the money, the salaries, the, uh, the food, uh, and uh, represented it themselves, turned it into hard currency. Nowadays, maybe cryptocurrency. Um, and of course, they knew their army. Uh, was completely disaffected, wouldn't fight for anything because there wasn't anything worth fighting for uh, in that army under that government. All right. And then let's wrap it up. So the next uh, few days and weeks and months, uh, we haven't seen any military leaders resign. 
in the United States. We haven't seen anyone been fired. Uh, uh, oh, that's so 20th century. Uh, no, 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 no. If you're a 21st century American uh, general or admiral, <laughs> never resign. Uh, yes. But what if you're a 21st century commander in chief? You don't fire anybody? Nobody well, is held responsible? Uh, well, you see, actually, the commanders in chief have looked at uh, the people who brought us in one disaster after another in recent years, um, that is, say, ever since roughly the beginning of the Clinton administration, um, and, um, and, and certainly the George W. Bush administration. No resignations. Uh, they didn't fire anybody. Uh, no apologies. So, what's your prediction? <laughs> and what happens? Eventually, the media may, may loathe and despise somebody for partisan purposes, just like they loathe and despise George W. Bush. I think they were quite correct to do so. Uh, and, um, but then after he's done his thing, has gotten out of there, then they allow him to go to back home to his ranch or whatever, in his case, a ranch, and, uh, and paint paintings, the quality of Hunter Biden's paintings and bought by the same kind of people for the same kind of reason. Anyway, they allow him to go back there and then they develop an image. So this time it's now a kind of kindly, gentle grandfather who has a continuing interest in international, in world of, in American affairs, but uh, uh, really is a kind of, uh, you know, a gentle person, intriguing personality. But in terms of uh, what comes next right now in the Biden administration, uh, you don't see anybody uh, in, in Japan, they'd have to perform seppuku, wouldn't they? Oh, yes. I, I've always thought that was a very good idea for the Japanese. And it was also a way of keeping your leadership on toes so they wouldn't have to do that. Uh, well, uh, I guess I would say that'd be a good idea. That would be a good import from Japan. But that's not going to happen. So what will happen to the United States in terms of our, we've done all these other countries. Well, I think it happened to the think, United States. I think it's perfectly symbolic. Now we had rule by uh, three successive baby boomer presidents, presidents of the baby boomer generation, uh, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, uh, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, he, he's just, he doesn't quite fit. Per yeah, he, I guess he, he's at the very last, the baby boomer generation. Those three baby boomer generations, everybody thought, especially with the, de with the death of John McCain, well, the generation before that, the silent generation, some so silent they were almost invisible between the greatest generation, one World War II, and the, silent, and the baby boomer generation, <laughs> they protested the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, everybody thought, but the silent generation had its chance and it hadn't done anything with it. Well, surprise, surprise. Uh, America uh, uh, has discovered rule by gerontocracy. We don't have any good reason for it, but that's what we have. And so we have uh, uh, Joe Biden, sure enough, born in the silent generation. Then we have Nancy Pelosi, uh, slightly older. Joe Biden, she was eight, she's now 81, 80 years, 81 years old. And then we have uh, 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 Bernie Sanders. He's also that. Oh, but now Mr. McConnell, he's a young fellow. I guess that makes him the most intellectually vibrant and fertile of the top leadership uh, and Chuck Schumer. But what we really have here is uh, first a disgrace. Uh, it should be a tragedy. It's really a comedy. It's not uh, or a farce. But uh, what it really is is symbolic. That is to say, I believe there's a natural life cycle of empires. And at the end of the empire, many signs of decay, uh, 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 disintegration, dementia begin to occur. That the empires normally last on average about 250 to 300 years. And we're, uh, in the case of the United States, the empire that I described in my book, I considered founded at uh, 1945. But the United States, since the Constitution, was, of course, founded just about 250 years ago. And so uh, that's coming to an end. Uh, and well, just like in the life cycle of a human being, 
in the last few years of their life, according to Psalm 90 in the Bible, uh, uh, after 70 years, or maybe with a little bit of strength, as it says in Psalm 90, uh, another 10 years, about that time, well, the human being uh, begins to suffer noticeable decline, including mental decline. Well, I think Biden is a perfect symbol of the country, the nation that he's ruling over. They're both suffering dementia. All right. Well, with that provocative analysis, I think we'll uh, wrap it up for this time. I hope you'll come back for our next crisis, which I think you predicted uh, when we discussed your next book will be a financial crisis. Uh, no, no. The, the one that comes after the strategic crisis, once the debacles um, are so great, uh, and the military, who under the whole system of containment and deterrence and credibility have been proven they cannot provide containment and deterrence and credibility. Once that becomes clear, and that's very clear in Afghanistan, it may become clear when one of the three revisionist powers push further. Uh, once that becomes clear, uh, there will be a demoralization within the military, and then there will be a discrediting of the military in the minds of the wider public. So we get the military crisis. It sounds like the strategic crisis and the military crisis would be the same thing. No, the strategic crisis is a crisis in the system that the military, through its credibility, has supported. It's the system in which the United States orders the world. For example, these rules and norms, a liberal international order. But the military crisis is actually the beginning of the disintegration of the military itself. Well, even before Afghanistan, we had woke the woking of the military running amok, especially with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General uh, Milley, uh, and also the uh, the chairman, uh, the chief of naval operations, Admiral Gilday. They're, they're wokifying the military. So after the military crisis, uh, how will we... Uh, well, there'll be nothing left. You see. As a result of the military, a result of the medical crisis, economic crisis, political crisis, and then uh, the strategic crisis and the, and the military crisis, as a result of that, all the institutions of the United States, the institutions that hold the country together, that provide law, order, peace, prosperity, domestic tranquility, uh, all of those will have disintegrated. And so we will be reduced to simply a society that has no institutions holding together. We're back to the Hobbesian world of the war of all against all. And that will mean there will be the social crisis and the society will disintegrate. All right, well, we'll stay tuned. I hope it's not too soon, because I don't know how many more of these I can take in such quick succession. But I hope you'll come back to talk about the military and social crisis uh, as they develop. And uh, until then, for those who are watching this who want to know more about uh, this analysis, uh, you can get a copy of uh, The American Way of Empire, uh, uh, either in hardback, paperback, Kindle, audiobook, uh, uh, at uh, Amazon or uh, indeed Barnes and Noble or your bookstore can order it. Or if you don't want to get it yourself, ask your local library uh, or school library to order it for you. And uh, I think you won't be disappointed. So thank you for sharing your analysis with us today. And uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. We'll stop the recording.